guests before I introduce them. Just to remind you, tomorrow at noon, we're having another interesting guest. I was thinking that you know, there was the British invasion. Isa has now the Asian invasion. Uh, two speakers from Asia. Tomorrow we have Professor George Pan, who's the, the Dean of the Center of Jewish Studies from Shanghai in China. And he'll be speaking about Jews in China, legends, legends history, and new perspectives. And um, he just hosted me in China two or three weeks ago, so he's a fascinating scholar, and I think tomorrow's lecture will be really interesting, unique. Uh, so today, we're very honored to have uh, Mr. Chaudhry. Uh, today's lecture, the title of the speech is Hate Speech in Political Islam, Root Cause of Religious Extremism, Terrorism, and Jihad. He's a journalist, editor, publisher, and he's the, he's the owner and publisher of the weekly newspaper entitled Blitz in Bangladesh. Um, it's the largest and most influential anti-jihadist newspaper or periodical in Bangladesh. He's the editor-in-chief uh, of, the, of the vernacular weekly Jam Jamat. He's the advisor um, he's on the advisory board of Islam Israel Fellow, a group co-founded by Sheikh Abdal Hamdi Palazi. He received his uh, Master's in Journalism at the London School of Economics at the University of London. From 89 to 96, he was the Chief correspond uh, Correspondent for Itar Tas News, News Agency. Where were you? In, in Bangladesh? Yes. In Bangladesh. And in 96, he established the first private television station in Bangladesh, which is named A21 TV. His publications are wide. Uh, they're available in English and in Bangla. His most recent book, Inside the Madras, which is here for sale, uh, if you want, after the lecture, if you want to purchase a book, you're very welcome to. Um, it was published now, just recently, hot off the press, October 2009, in Bangladesh. And it's an extensive analysis of uh, Madras education and issues pertaining to this subject matter. Um, in 2007, he wrote Injustice and Jihad, which was a, co a compilation of articles critical of anti-Israel and anti-Semitic attitudes in Islamic majority countries. In 2007, um, he's, I'll just, he's won many uh, prizes and awards including the American Jewish Committee gave him the Moral Courage Award um, in uh, fighting for human rights and, and anti-jihadism in uh, Bangladesh. And this was the first time he came to the United States. In 2005, he won the Penn USA Freedom uh, to Write Award in recognition of his commitment to courageous journalism under extreme adversity. Um, currently, he's facing charges um, of sedition, treason, blasphemy, and espionage. And this sort of issue has been going on, unfortunately, since 2004, when he started, when, when this began, when he attended a conference at Hebrew University's uh, Writers Association, sorry, at the Hebrew Writers Association, which took place in Tel Aviv. In 2004, he was blindfolded and tortured, beaten, and interrogated for 10 days um, in order to try to get information out of him that he was a spy for Israel. He spent the next 17 months without trial in, in solitary confinement and was released in bail in 2005, but the charges have not been dropped and the, the judicial matters continue to this day. His trial that he's still engaged in began in January of 2008. So it's um, not only a privilege to have you here, but you know, in our work, um, we're very much concerned with the rise of radical Islam uh, at the Yale Initiative for the Interdiscipl Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism. Um, we always argue that antisemitism begins with Jews but never ends with Jews. And the people who are suffering most from radical extreme Islam, not Islam and not Muslims, but radical political Islam, are ultimately Muslims themselves. So it's very important that we have you here, and it's really an honor and a priv privilege for us that you're here. So thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, my gratitude to Professor Charles and the Yale University for kindly inviting me and Lauren. 
<laughs> she has been extending all our support, finally to bring me here in New Haven, thanks to both of you and to the University and all of you here. As the Professor Charles just mentioned that I face sedition treason and blasphemy in my country. And sedition bears capital punishment according to the Bangladeshi law. Now, Bangladeshi court and the government and the prosecution in their official language while framing the charge, they say by praising the Jews and Christians, by praising the Jews and Christians, I have heard the sentiment of Muslims. By criticizing the madrasas, I have tried to damage the image of Islam. By demanding relations between Bangladesh and Israel, I have tried and conspired against the sovereignty of Bangladesh. So, I mean, this is an um, example of how the Muslim countries are affected by hate speech. If you know about Friday sermon in mosques everywhere, in Muslim and non-Muslim countries, even in United States, in those so-called community mosques, you will hear that the Muslim clergy are trying to tell their people that Jews and Christians are your enemies. The one and only way to remain a good Muslim is to kill the Jews and Christians. Now, I'd like to bring here, <coughs> I'm sorry, one very um, important issue before I discuss about the hate speech. Only six months back, according to the official document in Bangladesh, the government said there is no Jewish population in that country, which is actually false. There are presently 3,500 Jews in Bangladesh, but they are not allowed to declare their religious identity as Jews. They have to write as Jehovah's Witness. In 1931, a Jewish synagogue was built in the capital city of Bangladesh, which was grabbed by the government in 1948. <coughs> and the Jewish synagogue is being used till today as a government office. Fortunately, the, they didn't remove the stone writing in front of the synagogue, and we have initiated a battle, legal battle, to get the synagogue back to my Jewish brothers and sisters in Bangladesh. And I was telling Professor Charles that we're planning to open that synagogue, reopen in January next year, and we will do everything in legal battle and with writings in my newspaper because unfortunately Muslim press is totally polluted, biased, rotten, as well as the Western media in the Muslim countries, but the media in Muslim countries, they play a hypocritic role. They don't have the guts to say certain things, the truth, they twist and molest the information. Associated Press will term a suicide bomber in the Muslim country as a mujahid, I mean jihadist, in a positive term. They don't have the guts to say that he's a criminal, but we do. And because we have the courage to tell the truth, we are the largest, most influential newspaper in my country. People would say that if I 
Tell the truth, people will not read, but people read our newspaper. It, it shows that <coughs> when you tell the truth, ultimately truth prevails. So about the hate speech, which is the political Islam and hate speech I would like to mention here. Unfortunately, most of the Muslim countries in today's Muslim countries, they are governed by political Islam. <coughs> And political Islam preaches killing innocent people in the name of jihad or rape of the virgin before executing them in Iran or marrying a breastfeeding girl in Iran under the Muslim marriage law. So these are the perverted activities in the name of Islam going on in the Muslim country. Now, if someone will ask me, and actually people, many people ask me so many times here in the United States and other countries, that why don't you abandon your religious identity and search for the truth? My reply is very simple. I know some people who are ex-Muslims, so they can do nothing to reform Islam because they are no more a part of the Muslim community. Being a Muslim in the Muslim community, we can, I can criticize Islam, bad things in Islam, and press our nation, our people, to ultimately adopt it good things. The hate speech is spreading as in Bangladesh now today in 73,000 madrasas. Most of them are Quranic madrasas. Yesterday one scholar in one of the American institutions in New York asked me that madrasas give free education to the people. So in the underprivileged countries like Bangladesh where people cannot get education, possibly madrasa is the only way for them to get some education. And I told them that madrasas, call me madrasas mean the Quranic madrasas, they only teach the people to read Quran, even not to understand Quran. So this is not education, it's, it's a kind of bad practice in the name of education. And Quranic madrasas teach people to hate all other religions. They provoke people in becoming a jihadist, promising 72 virgins for killing any Jew or any Christian. This is what is happening in 70,000, 73,000 madrasas in Bangladesh only. There are similar madrasas in all other Muslim countries. And unfortunately, there are some similar madrasas in the United States as well. Other Western cities. The second threat, which is another platform of the hate speech, is Tablik e Jamaat. There is the largest congregation of the Tablik e Jamaat in Bangladesh every year. And in 2005, the total number of people attending the congregation in Tablik e Jamaat was 2 million. In 2008, the number was 32 million. Mm. Only for the United States. 8,000 people attended the congregation of the Tablighi Jamaat. They stayed there for three days. I mean, I'm talking about the 8,000 from the United States. And 24 hours, they listened to the hate speech, taking a poison of hate speech back to the United States. Afterwards, what they do? I'm sure everyone can assume. And as a result, there is a movie in the United States named New York. 
It's an English movie. Hopefully, some of you have seen that movie. The New York movie says that after the 9-11, every Asian, it doesn't say Muslim, every Asian is treated by the American administration as a subject of suspicion. This movie shows that Federal Bureau of Investigation conspiring against the Muslims, putting wrong, false allegations against the Muslims, and finally, this movie gives a strong message of waging war, jihad, against the United States. You are watching this movie in this country because you are free society, democratic society, and if this is democracy, to let the jihadists continue the campaign, if this jihad, the democracy teaches, give the platform to the terrorists like Ahmadinejad and others like him to continue hate speech against Jews and Christians and Israel, I am against that democracy, of course. Because in the name of democracy, those people are spoiling the entire, entire atmosphere in the whole world. And what is the next phase for us? I mean, we have already seen what happened in 9-11. Two buildings were destroyed only. I can tell you that if we don't act now, the jihadists are gaining strength and power every day. And maybe the way Bangladeshi government grabbed the Jewish synagogue in 1948, jihadists will grab our peace, our dream, our happiness, everything one day. And a latest example from Bangladesh, there is one, there was one terrorist organization, Islamist named Hezbollah Tahrir, which was continuing campaign against Jews and Christians being funded by Britain, Saudi Arabia, and Africa. And this group, they were so powerful, no media in Bangladesh or anywhere in the world wrote anything against them. We continued to cover and expose Hijrut Dahari activities and finally 10 days back Bangladeshi government banned that group. Now there is another group named Hijbut Tawhid. It says Jewish and Christian modernizations are evils and it openly selling books and DVDs in the Bangladeshi market and in other countries in the world calling upon the people to kill the Jews and Christians. <clears throat> now, I spoke to our government before I came to the United States, suggesting them to immediately ban that group. And one of the ministers were arguing with me about, this was uh, freedom of expression, I think. To provoke people to kill someone is not a freedom of expression. If the countries in the world try to <coughs> judge such activities as freedom of expression, then possibly we will even fail one day to blame Al-Qaeda of certain activities they are doing against the humanity and against the global peace. So, the entire project of radical Islam to spread the hate speech amongst the people, to give the people the hope of 72 virgins and provoke the people in killing others in hope of that 72 virgin. I, I, being a Muslim, I think that if that religion, Islam, Promises 72 virgin for killing someone is a religion of poverty people. 
and a God who can give that kind of message to the people for killing others for those virgins this is the religion in back taste and the God, God I don't want to mention what kind of God it is so again I am saying everything being a Muslim I am a practicing Muslim I am not an atheist or an ex-Muslim because we have to definitely identify the problems in Islam. The problem is Islam is more a political Islam now and leadership of Muslim nations are in the hands of some evils who are trying to continue their power in Saudi Arabia and Iran and other countries. And in order to continue their status being the rulers and monarchs in the Muslim nations, they are creating their own cadre of people in other countries who are on one hand giving support to them, on the other hand trying to behave like a hijacker who would hijack an aircraft with 300 plus passengers but four hijackers and the 300 passengers are absolutely helpless in the hands of four. So the whole global community will become helpless in the handpicked number of criminals like Ahmadinejad and others in many other countries very soon if we do not realize the problems and if we do not initiate our action plans to combat jihad, to combat political Islam and to combat the notions in the Muslim nations where the Holocaust is being seen by some Muslims as a great work. Some Muslim scholars openly in media say that Hitler would have did a mistake, he would have killed, he should have killed all the Jews. So I wrote something against Hitler in my Facebook account a few days back and there was a violent reaction even from some, some people in Germany condemning why I criticize Hitler. So, I mean, just I am giving those short examples of what's happening in and how we can very quick react or take actions on our own. This is the first thing and we have to definitely do something to stop the spread of political Islam and Jihad and we have to check the growth or further growth of Tablighi Jamaat everywhere we live. Thank you very much. I mean, it, I have a, I gave, I gave a lecture, lecture script in writing, which was more broadband because we don't have enough time. So anyone, you can ask a question on the basis of that paper or what I say. I mean, anyone is welcome. Heather, you just help me. In, yes. yes, please. Okay, so no, I'm going to actually, Heather. excuse me, I'm going to start off with a question. Um, so as you know, come here. Okay, as you know, in the, in the West, there is a, there is a phenomenon of, a, a, of Islamophobia. There is discrimination against Muslims in the West. So my question is, um, I wonder if the portrayal of Muslims in Southeast Asia and Bangladesh ought to be done more carefully and separating out Muslims in Southeast Asia, which actually have a tradition of being very open, and the rise of radical Islam. So my question is, in light of that context, what has caused the rise of radical Islam in Bangladesh? And to what, to what extent is it pervasive in the society? Is it taking over institutions? Is it still marginal? And the third point is, you keep saying we have to do something. What are your suggestions? What can we do? Very, uh, I mean, very important question. What makes people getting more allure towards jihadist activities? This is, as I said, the hate speech which continues for decades and decades. 
And the hate speech, it doesn't only give a poison of hatred in the minds of the people, but it even gives a convincing notion to the people that if someone can be, become a jihadist, pronouncing jihad against the infidels and Jews and Christians, they get the heaven. I mean, this is a very unique, excellent instrument <coughs> used by the Muslim clergy to hypnotize the uneducated or half-educated people in my country and other Muslim countries as well. <clears throat> On the other hand, the Islamic banking, which is gaining strength everywhere in the world, finally giving huge financial backup to those pro-jihadist activities. So if someone becomes a jihadist or pro-jihadist, a member of any of those radical Islamist group, they get the job opportunities, money for business. So naturally it is now only not only that hope for the heaven but also fun which they are getting and job and etc. provided by those Islamic banking network and some so called Islamic philanthropic groups like Al Haramain institutions and many other groups like this which gives the fundings. So there is money and there is the provocation and how it can be checked or come, come, how we can fight. First of all, <coughs> all those nations I mentioned are definitely having great um, volume of trade with the West, including the United States. Bangladesh receives 64 million US dollar as aid every year. <clears throat> On the other hand, we are exporting textile products to US worth of billions of dollars. If the government of the United States could tell the Bangladeshi government to check the hate speech, stop sermons in the mosque against Jews and Christians, obviously, if the trade is given, trade is, trade is used as an instrument of negotiating with those governments, that could be the first beginning because uh, we, I cannot, nobody can say that the hate speech which continued for decades, we can go for a counter hate speech and change the people overnight. Now we have to go for some massive legal actions and the massive legal actions should be taken by the respective government and the respective government will take the actions only when they will feel that if they don't take the action, it goes against the economic interest of that country. Thank you. <coughs> you take the question, because, yes. Yeah. Sure, sure. So you went to ask the question. Uh, you speak of, it, uh, of political Islam. Uh, what is, uh, what is the basic foundation of Islam in general that finds it so easy to find a uh, home in, uh, for political Islam? My, my, my problem is, is there, a, is there a difference between political Islam and Islam uh, in general? And why does it find such an easy residence in Islam? I think John was asking, what is it about Islam, the religion, that makes it conducive, that makes it uh, fit with this political Islam, the violent kind of uh, political ideology, and, and what is the difference between Islam <coughs> and, the political Islam. and this, this violent, uh, and is there something about the religion that makes it uh, compatible? There are something in Quran which gives provocations to jihad. It's a lot of things. I know that. So, unfortunately, and then there are, of course, some hadith, and then Fikr, Prophet Sir Charles knows. I mean, now the Islam is not only in Quran. It is with the hadith and <coughs> sermons and Fikr 
and more it has depend more it is becoming dependent on hadith and fiqh which promotes this jihad and hatred and war i mean this is all dirty bad things are being promoted in hadith and all other things which are ultimate interpretation of quran and <clears throat> even there are some criminal interpretation of quran purposefully done by some clergies to mislead the people for example one particular quote but every Muslim nation <clears throat> you will read it says that uh, those of you make friendship with Jews and Christians you will be no more a Muslim it, it's something like this in interpretation but the original text it says that those of you <clears throat> take Jews and Christians as your religious teacher you are no more a Muslim I mean this is in Quran, the original text is something else, but interpretation is something else. On the other hand, as I say, that there are more influence in Islam of hadith, fiqh, and sermons given by various so-called Muslim scholars. <clears throat> so these are mostly violent notions given to the Muslims. And why people are getting allured to it is Number one is lack of education, poverty, and a kind of unique um, tendency amongst most of the Muslim people that which I mean they feel that <coughs> I'm sorry which which they which they feel that uh, I mean Muslims are being somehow deprived and Christians and Jews they have been depriving the Muslims. So it is a time for them to take retaliation. You understand? So these are the things which are giving avenues for more and more jihadist growth in, in, in Bangladesh and other Muslim countries. Some of the researchers are here. Yes. I think uh, Professor Charles, you can. Okay. <coughs> okay. So the other question. Okay. Um, First of all, I'd like to say that I'm very impressed and grateful for your bravery. It's very hard for um, some of us over here who, who think a lot of the same things that you think to, um, to grasp just how difficult it is to say them in your part of the world. And so I'm very grateful for you being there. But I, I'd like to ask you a question, which is, can you give me some sense of this, the size of the population there that actually hates Jews openly and the percentage that agrees with you? Are the, is it just you and a small handful? Or is there 20%, 30%? What, you know, you know, how, does, how would Bangladesh break down in terms of the prevail, prevailing sentiments towards Jews and towards radical Islam? Um, grateful to you for your courage first. And in terms of percentages, what percentage of the Bangladeshi people do you think are anti-Semitic? What percentage are with you? What percentage would be maybe openly anti-Semitic? What percentage maybe sort of have some of those attitudes but wouldn't voice them? How much? How many just want to maybe live their lives and are not anti-Semitic? What are the percentages? Um, actually, thank you very much for the question. Uh, I would like to say that as I just mentioned that majority of the people everywhere in the world, they are not militants. I mean, not Muslim, every, 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 every citizen of the countries, but there are only very few fractional number in every society, especially in the Muslim nation. But unfortunately, if you are asking me about the proportion, how, many of the, how much of the number of, out of 150 million population in Bangladesh, how much how many are militants and how many are moderate? I personally cannot tell you any figure because there is no such surveys on it. And on the other hand, there are many people who are against jihad and militant activities, but they don't speak out. They don't have the courage to speak out. That's the one problem. 
The other thing is, when we started, when I started my works in two, I mean, since I was arrested, and since we have continued our newspaper, I can just give you one example that in 2003, we had approximately 2,000 only circulation of the print edition. <clears throat> now we are selling 37,000 every week. And you will go to the website, you will see that Blake is the largest newspaper in the Muslim country. And everybody knows, because we, we officially say that we are the, our editorial policy is Zionist editorial policy. We officially say that, and people are reading it. I mean, large number of people, they read it, they appreciate it, and even many of them are writing uh, within our editorial policy, but with a request not to use their name, so we change the name. In, in this case, uh, I mean, I'm sure that you got the reply that there is no official figure that I can tell you, but big number, large number of people, if not the majority of the people, large number of people, they are not anti-Semitic because some people are were anti-Semitic where because there was one-sided media flow in Muslim countries still today, and which is always telling bad things about Israel and so-called repression of Muslims and Israel. Like, you understand? I'm sure you know. So those kind of news coverages and flow of the information were leaving a negative impact in the minds of the people. But now, when people start getting the other side, even in my newspaper, we saw that people are gradually waking up. Even I can mention to you one very particular thing that I mentioned about the synagogue, the Jewish synagogue. And those who have taken the initiatives to reopen the synagogue are some prominent professors of Dhaka University, some students of the Dhaka University, large number, and especially those students studying in the English medium schools in Bangladesh, they are absolutely not anti-Semitic at all. So this is a positive sign, and I have every reason to be hopeful for that. <laughs> Thank you for your presentation. I, I also concur with the previous commentator that um, you're doing some really courageous work and, and other things benefit to us all. Um, so I had a question regarding both the paper and the presentation. Um, what, I guess one of my overarching oh sorry one of my overarching concerns um, with the paper as well as some of the comments that were made was that um, one of the things that development scholars today as well as um, Middle East study scholars are focusing on, they're trying to nuance this debate between um, the West and the rest, or the West and the other. So rather than trying to just look at the West and um, the ideologies of the West versus the other, um, they're trying to look at the nuances between the differences to sort of understand the dynamics and the differences between those two sociopolitical positions. Um, so one of the things I guess I'm largely concerned about is that the paper as well as the presentation seem to um, paint with a, Latin, with a rather broad brush this idea that Muslims hold this ideology that um, Israel is bad, Jews are bad, Christians are bad, whereas it doesn't really focus on the nuances within Bangladeshi society. So you mentioned, like for example, 73,000 madasas um, as a sort of as sort of embodying this very pejorative ideology um, that need to be addressed, yet I would be sort of hard, it would, it's hard pressed to imagine that all 73,000 of these institutions are all uh, um, holding these anti Semitic biases, <coughs> anti Semitic ideologies. Um, so, um, you know, perhaps uh, just as a comment, it might be useful to sort of draw the nuances between um, you know, okay, in your analysis rather than just. Okay. Before I reply to this question, first of all, I beg apology because on 22nd of February this year, my officer attacked, and uh, the attackers they, they tremendously beat me on both of my ears and head. So since then, I am under treatment. So uh, now I can hear a little bit, but I was almost 
unable to hear anything even three months back, so it's improving. And I, that's why I beg your apology that I have to take the help of Heather to just retransmit the question to me here. Okay, I hope I can do it justice. <laughs> um, Heather is a journalist working for American newspapers, and she is my sister. Mm -hmm. She helping me a lot, yeah. So first, thank you for your courage, and he's wondering if the way you characterize um, the the schism between the West and the Islamic world, with respect, is it a little too broad brushed? What the madrasas you talk about, the 73,000, are they really all teaching the hatred of Israel in such a black and white way? Or maybe is there more, more differences among the different madrasas, maybe some are more extreme than others, maybe some not so full of hatred. Is there more nuance to it, maybe, than what you say? <clears throat> that the essence, I guess? I know. Uh, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. No, please. Even in the example that you provided with the movie New York, New York certainly wasn't about um, sort of, you know, describe, sort of idolizing um, um, political Islam, terrorism, or anything. What New York really suggested, it, it was about, it was a perfect example of what happens when people, when a nation begins to curbing civil liberties, um, um, and they sort of deep, jump off the deep end when they begin sort of curtailing civil liberties, civil li rights of a particular group um, based on a very small population of that group who committed a very heinous act. So, you know, New York wasn't about, um, wasn't certainly about sort of what you suggested. It was it was much more um, dynamic than that. Um, the film really does capture sort of the need to make sure that when we're living in a democratic society, when something really bad, when something really terrible happens, that we don't um, begin scapegoating an entire population um, based on the actions of a small group. So he, he wonders if he thinks the movie New York, he thinks it was not actually, he, he has a different perception of the film than you. He wonders if it's more about uh, the alienation of people when civil liberties are curtailed after a, a tragedy like 9-11, instead of being about how Asians in the U.S. are, are he didn't view it as incitement, the movie New York. He had a different view of the film. Um, okay, you have seen the New York movie, right? Yeah. And I am uh, actually uh, my background. Professor Charles told you that I work. I, I work for the television channel, and I know. Of course, you also know, and we, we both know. So I would request you once again to see that movie, and I'm sure you will change your opinion. And about the Madrasa, the question you asked is very important. That whether the, all the 73,000 madrasas are militants or there's something good, right? Okay. Can you produce the mineral water in the plant which produces black level whiskey? Oh, no, that's, a, that's not a rhetorical question. Oh, um, um. Madrasas are basically mission to create jihadists. And if you are asking me if there is something good in madrasas, I will tell you yes. Kindergarten madrasas, which are generating English speaking, French, and modern jihadists, those are uneducated and half educated jihadists. Now there are new versions of madrasas called kindergarten madrasas and cadet madrasas, which are generating more modern and elite type. Jihad is that, that is the difference. Otherwise, if you kindly go through the madrasa education system, or if you will kindly please read materials about the madrasa anywhere, not my materials, you read any other materials, then I'm talking about the Qawmi madrasa, that is the Quranic madrasa. So they teach them only to read the Quran, not to understand the Quran, and beside that, they, they teach them to spread the message of Islam 
in the mosque and madras everywhere through the sermon and how you can spread the message of islam is to continue in giving hate speeches i will if you kindly can give me your email address then i will provide you as much as materials you want in madras and i will also be very interested if you can give me even one material which gives a good information about madrasa that what i said are wrong there is something some good news just give me one paper which will show that one one particular madrasa is very good there is no jihad in that madrasa uh, i would be very i would be very grateful to receive that paper from you but uh, in my experience in, with uh, as a as a journalist and as, as an editor i unfortunately didn't find that if you can find it definitely i will welcome that material I have one question. You mentioned that um, you answered the question, how can you combat political Islam? You mentioned that um, you can do something from the United States, for example. You can put pressure on the country from the outside. How important is that um, and what can you do from inside the country? How important is support for your work from the United States or from other countries? Um, how important is it to agitate from the outside? How much is your efforts to reform um, in Bangladesh, how much is the outside? Reform education? Yeah, no. you, just your efforts to, to reform the educational system and, and political Islam in general to influence sort of more moderate uh, course. How important is help from the outside, from the United States, from other countries, pressure on the government maybe? Help, what, what can we do and how much is the outside uh, is important? Uh, thank you very much. Actually, uh, you are from India? Canada. Okay. <laughs> there are a large number of Jewish population in India. And as I, as I say, there are 3,500 Jews in Bangladesh. Till last year, they even didn't have the copies of Torah for them. We made it printed in Bangladesh this year in Bengali. And actually, we are not giving it free of cost. We are selling it, but people are buying. And this is first thing. Secondly, how we are approaching to change the whole situation is more and more interfaith dialogue between a Muslim and a Christian, uh, between a Muslim and a Jew. And I have quite a number of Jewish friends who are communicating with their counterparts in Bangladesh. Even I uh, arranged some meeting between extreme Islamist group and some Jewish leaders, not politically, but I mean this activists in Bangladesh, and they sat together, they discussed, they argued, they fought in wars, not in physically, they did not fight, and they agreed to do the agree on many issues. And finally, the good thing is that some of those Islamist parties who were not ready to hear Israel or Jews <coughs> wrote to Bangladeshi government to lift the travel ban on Israel. Because we told them that they had an impression that in, in Israel, the five-star hotels are being built on the graveyards of Muslims. And you know, all those bad kind of campaign, you are completely aware of it. And they were almost believing that. So we said, you go to Israel, you see the situation with your own eyes, try to communicate with them, make arguments, let agree to disagree, but try to know the other side. And as you can understand that when I was arrested in 2003, there was no voice in my favor. I was in, 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 in jail for 17 months. So now, we are running the newspaper, although uh, six attacks were there. I mean, once it was, my office was bombed and 
and, and I was even abducted once last year. But besides that, I mean, we are running that newspaper, a proclaimed Zionist newspaper in the capital city with its print and online edition. And I'm going to the office every day and they know who am I. Everybody, most of the people in my country, they know. So things are changing in this direction that now in 2004, for example, five, when I was released, we were not having any visitor in my office because they were thinking that visiting my office is a kind of sin or a crime. But now we have hundreds of visitors coming, Hindus, Ahmadiyas, and, and Muslims. People are coming. So inter, inter, interfaith exchange of information, I mean, interfaith dialogue, interfaith understanding. This is most important point where we can make an end to anti-Semitism or anti-Christianity or anti-Jewish notions in the people. That's exactly what we are doing. And besides that, if you will kindly read Blitz, weekly Blitz, then you will see that we are bringing the Israeli news right from the Israeli sources to the Bangladeshi readers. It is not a twisted information going via a short press or AFP or Al, Al Jazeera television with their own interpretation. We are giving them exactly what's happening. And that's why, uh, um, for example, we have established one group last month called Bangladeshi Israel Friendship Society. And we have now almost 9,000 members. So you can imagine people are coming and people are coming forward. And this is very good sign. It will change. It will change, of course. very provocative and controversial to use that concept in the American context to describe radical Islamist movements. So I'm just wondering if you can articulate, um, as a Bangladeshi Muslim, why you choose to use that concept to describe these movements. And secondly, um, in your paper you write that you were able to avoid the Islamist brainwashing because of your own personal curiosity and because of your access to the internet and access to um, certain types of information and facts. And as we try and think of, uh, develop ways to refute Islamist ideology, what facts were most important in your mind um, in, in <coughs> leading you to realize um, that these ideologies are um, totalitarian or um, pernicious ideologies? What facts were important to you? Okay. I think the first part is an uh, interesting choice to use totalitarianism, the word totalitarian, to describe these jihadist movements. So Lady asked why you chose that word. And then what was it you said in your uh, paper you were able to resist the brainwashing to political Islam? What were the factors? that enabled you to think freely and how can that apply to other people? How can we encourage other, others to, to think uh, more independently like you? Powerful question, eh? Are you a journalist? <laughs> no. Actually, you see uh, how I was not like many other Bangladeshis or many other Muslims because my father was from my childhood, uh, he was educated in, from India. He is from Calcutta University. So naturally, in Calcutta University, those people are from that university. They are more moderate than not from that university. From my childhood, we had the atmosphere where we are mixing with the Hindus and Sikhs. Of course, not Jews because but other religions. And particularly when I was working with the Russian news agency, I had hundreds of Jewish friends in Russia, of course. And I had the opportunity to see them from a very close distance because they were like my fellow colleagues, my, my family members. So <clears throat> I definitely was convinced that the way Islam says or the clergy say that Jews are evil people or Christians is not the truth because I saw the reality with my own eyes. So if you ask me how I changed, I, I learned 
from my own experience, I did not apply my religious mind, I applied my human mind, and my human mind led me to understand that what others say are not correct thing. We, we have something else as a reality, and the reality is Jews and Christians are not our enemies. They are absolutely like our brothers and sisters. And I just wanted to supplement one reply to her question about the changes, positive changes. Bangladeshi passport, since independence of Bangladesh, Israel was the third, one of the first three countries to recognize Bangladesh. But Bangladeshi passport, till today, Heather has seen, it, it's written, it, the passport is valid for all countries of the world except Israel. And because of our effort from last year, Bangladesh government has withdrawn the travel ban on the, our official passports. I'm not an official, so I cannot travel to Israel, but official passport is all countries of the world. They can visit, so changing. And about your question again, this, Everybody, every Muslim, if he, he can forget that he has to be a Muslim, to be a Muslim he has to hate the Jews and Christian. If he can just forget it and apply his human mind and try to look into the realities, read the other things, then obviously if you will please ask anyone, if you have a colleague Muslim who, uh, who has little bit of inclination towards jihad. You ask him or her that did he or she ever read other religious books, they will say no. We heard from the clergy. So instead of hearing to the clergy, try to read. And I read and I've changed. People are reading, people will change. So this, this is the where I was not like others. There's a question here and then you have an original question. So <clears throat> Has the recent violence in Pakistan had any impact on the government of Bangladesh? Uh, and do you think it may have altered their attitude toward radical Islam and the madrasas? Has the recent violence in Pakistan had any effect on the government of Bangladesh? And do you think it may influence their uh, handling of the madrasas? No, actually Pakistan, you know, the violence in Pakistan is quite a regular news. You, you get the news about violence in Pakistan almost every other month. So it doesn't make any special effect on other Muslim countries, including Bangladesh. But uh, as I say that this violence in Pakistan is more a political issue than it's a religious issue. Uh, it's a conflict between PPP, People's Party, and the Muslim League, and the MQM. These are something else. On the other hand, the Pakistani intelligence agencies, ISI, they also sometimes make their own incidents, manufacture incidents, to draw the attention. And these are all absolutely their own internal political issues. So naturally, it, it doesn't affect Bangladesh. But what effect is, as I say that, if you will kindly look through the Muslim world, even the South Asia, the, the movement of the Tablighi Jamaat has greatly increased. Inter-country exchange of Tablighi Jamaat has greatly increased since last three years especially. So this is very important, very alarming situation, but otherwise that incident in Pakistan is absolutely, Pakistan is of almost a failed nation, so they have their own problems. Thank you for coming to New Haven to speak on this subject, which is very important to us and very unsettling to hear what's going on in Bangladesh. Would you describe briefly your imprisonment and the circumstances of your release? Thank you for coming, for your courage, and very important issues. Um, would you describe the circumstances of your, your arrest, your imprisonment, your, and your release? 
Uh, I'm not yet released. I'm facing the trial, and the trial resumes on the 11th of November. Mm -hmm. I'm here with the court orders for two weeks to travel abroad. And <clears throat> as I say that, that the, I, I'm facing three charges, sedition, treason, and blasphemy. Sedition, treason, and blasphemy because I, I just mentioned at the beginning of the, my talks. Now, Bangladeshi government is, or the judiciary is, are not willing to drop the charges, although they are, mm, Professor Erwin Kotler of Canada, he is my international attorney, and he has submitted papers uh, in, in, in favor of mm, my defense, where he has categorically mentioned that the charges cannot be maintained at all. Because I can just give one example. They say in the charges that I wrote an article in USA Today titled Hello Tel Aviv, and in that article I criticized Islam. But uh, I never sent any such article to USA Today, nor any such article was ever published in USA Today. But the court is continuing the trial with a statement provided by the prosecution of the content of that article. They don't check whether it was ever sent or published. You understand, this is a whole the made-up story <clears throat> against me. And there are some pressures on the government from <clears throat> some countries, some groups, to continue this case. And finally, to leave a strong signal for others who then they, they would not <coughs> come up and speak out against jihad, etc. So this is a very unique case, and if you will, we have a website www.interfaithstrength.com. If you go there, you will get all the details about this case. I understand the charges have not been dropped, but was it pressure from your attorneys which uh, led to them releasing you from your imprisonment? He says he understands the charges have not been dropped, but he wondered about was the circumstances that led to the release from the torture and imprisonment. Uh, Immediately release what? The first time after they, they captured you okay. and held you in prison. And, uh, he wondered if it was your attorneys who got you out of prison. No, actually uh, there was um, some... We have initiated a battle, legal battle, to get the synagogue back to my Jewish brothers and sisters in Bangladesh. And I was telling Professor Charles that we are planning to open that synagogue, reopen in January next year. and. We will do everything in legal battle and with writings in my newspaper because unfortunately Muslim press is totally polluted, biased, rotten, as well as the Western media in the Muslim countries, but the media in Muslim countries, they play a hypocritical role. They don't have the guts to say certain things, the truth, they twist and molest the information. Associated Press will term a suicide bomber in the Muslim country as a mujahid, I mean jihadist, in a positive term. They don't have the guts to say that he's a criminal, but we do. And because we have the courage to tell the truth, we are the largest, most influential newspaper in my country, people would say that if I tell the truth, people will not read, but people read our newspaper. It, it shows that when you tell the truth, ultimately truth prevails. So about the hate speech, which is the political Islam and hate speech I would like to mention here. Unfortunately, most of the Muslim countries in today's Muslim country, they are governed by political Islam. <clears throat> and political Islam preaches killing innocent people in the name of jihad, or rape of the virgin before executing. Um, it was published now, just recently, hot off the press, October 2009 in Bangladesh. 
and it's an extensive analysis of uh, Madras education and issues pertaining to this subject matter. Um, in 2007, he wrote Injustice and Jihad, which was a, co a compilation of articles critical of anti-Israel and anti-Semitic attitudes in Islamic majority countries. In 2007, um, he's, I'll just, he's won many uh, prizes and awards, including the American Jewish Committee gave him the Moral Courage Award um, in uh, fighting for human rights and, and anti-jihadism in uh, Bangladesh. And this was the first time he came to the United States. In 2005, he won the Penn USA Freedom uh, to Write Award in recognition of his commitment to courageous journalism under extreme adversity. Um, currently, he's facing charges um, of sedition, treason, blasphemy, and espionage. And this sort of issue has been going on, unfortunately, since 2004, when he started, when, when this began, when he attended a conference at Hebrew universities. Uh, Writers Associate, sorry, uh, the Hebrew Writers Association, which took place in Tel Aviv. In 2004, he was blindfolded and tortured, beaten, and t interrogated for 10 days um, in order to try to get information out of him that he was a spy for Israel. He spent the next 17 months without trial in, in solitary confinement and was released in bail in 2005, but the charges have not been dropped and the, the Judicial matters continue to this day. His trial that he's still engaged in began in January of 2008. So it's um, not only a privilege to have you here, but you know, in our work, um, we're very much concerned with the rise of radical Islam. Uh, I guess before I introduce him, just to remind you, tomorrow at noon, we're having another interesting guest. I was thinking that you know, there was the British invasion. Isa has now the Asian invasion, uh, two speakers from Asia. Tomorrow we have Professor George Pan, who's the, the Dean of the Center of Jewish Studies from Shanghai in China. And he'll be speaking about Jews in China, legends, legends history, and new perspectives. And um, he just hosted me in China two or three weeks ago, so he's a fascinating scholar, and I think tomorrow's lecture will be really interesting, unique. Uh, so today, we're very honored to have uh, Mr. Chaudhry, uh, today's lecture, the title of the speech is Hate Speech and Political Islam, Root Cause of Religious Extremism, Terrorism, and Jihad. He's a journalist, editor, publisher, and he's the, he's the owner and publisher of the weekly newspaper entitled Blitz in Bangladesh. Um, it's the largest and most influential anti-jihadist newspaper or periodical in Bangladesh. He's the editor-in-chief uh, of, the, of the vernacular weekly Jam Jamat. He's the advisor, um, he's on the advisory board of Islam Israel Fellow, a group co-founded by Sheikh Abdal Hamdi Palazi. He received his uh, master's in journalism at the London School of Economics at the University of London. From 89 to 96, he was the chief correspond uh, correspondent for Itar Tas news, news Agency. Where were you? In, in Bangladesh? Yes. In Bangladesh. And in 96, he established the first private television station in Bangladesh, which is named A21 TV. His publications are wide. Uh, they're available in English and in Bangla. His most recent book, Inside the Madras, which is here for sale, uh, if you want, after the lecture, if you want to purchase a book, you're very welcome to. The Muslim countries are affected by hate speech. If you know about fried salmon in mosques everywhere, in Muslim and non-Muslim countries, even in the United States, in those so-called community mosques, you will hear that the Muslim clergy are trying to tell their people that Jews and Christians are your enemies. The one and only way to remain a good Muslim is to kill the Jews and Christians. 
Now, I'd like to bring here, <coughs> I'm sorry, one very um, important issue before I discuss about the hate speech. Only six months back, according to the official document in Bangladesh, the government said there is no Jewish population in that country, which is actually false. There are presently 3,500 Jews in Bangladesh, but they are not allowed to declare their religious identity as Jews. They have to write as Jehovah's Witness. In 1931, a Jewish synagogue was built in the capital city of Bangladesh, which was grabbed by the government in 1948 <coughs> and the Jewish synagogue is being used till today as a government office. Fortunately, the, they didn't remove the stone writing in front of the synagogue and at the Yale Initiative for the Interdiscipl Interdisciplinary Study of Antisemitism, um, we always argue that anti-Semitism begins with Jews but never ends with Jews. And the people who are suffering most from radical extreme Islam, not Islam and not Muslims, but radical political Islam, are ultimately Muslims themselves. So it's very important that we have you here and it's really an honor and a pri privilege for us that you're here. So thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, First of all, my gratitude to Professor Charles and the Yale University for kindly inviting me and Lauren. <laughs> she has been extending all our support finally to bring me here in New Haven. Thanks to both of you and to the Yale University and all of you here. As the Professor Charles just mentioned that I face sedition, treason and blasphemy in my country. And sedition bears capital punishment, according to the Bangladeshi law. Now, Bangladeshi court and the government and the prosecution, in their official language, while framing the charge, they say by praising the Jews and Christians, by praising the Jews and Christians, I have heart the sentiment of Muslims. By criticizing the madrasas, I have tried to damage the image of Islam. By demanding relations between Bangladesh and Israel, I have tried and conspired against the sovereignty of Bangladesh. So, I mean, this is an um, example of how